Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in our country over the past week or so. And as usual, there are a number of issues that are ripe for discussion and therefore we are never out of topics or issues to discuss. As is usual, I want to take this opportunity to extend greetings to all uh, our viewers who are joining us on television in quarantine, Barbies, New Amsterdam, Region 5, West Coast, Barbies, Maikoni, Mahaika, etc. I want to also welcome our viewers who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown. And last but not least, I want to welcome our viewers who are joining us live on Facebook right across the length and breadth of Guyana, the Caribbean, and of course in North America and even further afield. Welcome to another program. And I want to begin by extending Shubhna Ratri greetings to all my Hindu brothers and sisters right across Guyana and indeed the world. This is that period of the year where we offer prayers to Mother Durga and ask that she blesses us with good health, prosperity and remove from our path all obstacles and all obstructions. I want to also take this opp opportunity to extend Ramadan greetings to all our Muslim brothers and sisters right across Guyana and indeed the world. This is the holy month and our Muslim brothers and sisters will be fasting for this entire month. And I want to take this opportunity to say Ramadan Karim or Ramadan Mubarak, if you wish. And I also want to take this opportunity to reflect upon the fact that we are a society that is so multicultural and so religiously diverse and we enjoy such peace, tranquility and religious tolerance that our people, Hindus and Muslims, can do their respective and individual worshipping side by side. I remarked today in a Facebook post that we just came out of Easter and just one week before that we celebrated Pagwa. And of course we celebrated the conclusion of Lent. And now we are celebrating Pag uh, um, Naurat and Ramadan simultaneously almost. And we are doing so in love and unity. We must not take these things for granted because there are still societies in the world, there are still countries in the world where religious wars are being fought, where blood is being shed in the name of religion. And here it is, a country with so many cultural, ethnic and religious differences. We can celebrate together and we can celebrate as one people different cultural pursuits and different religious uh, festivals in love and in unity and that is a great trait and characteristic of our country and as I said we must reject all those who are attempting to sow the seeds of division in our land and there are a few every time they speak all they can speak about is racism, is about spreading this unity, is creating unnecessary strife, fabricating 
allegations and contentions to achieve these objectives. Aubrey Norton, a leader of the PNC, has put, made certain posts on his Facebook page and I saw the president responding to it after being asked by reporters. I have not read Mr. Norton posts, but based upon the news reports, it is alleged that Mr. Norton is accusing this government of discrimination in favor of Indo-Guyanese, that we are only spending money in communities in which Indo-Guyanese live, and that the budget and the policies of our government are racially directed. This is the sickness of these people. Every time they open their minds, their mind is a cesspit and a cesspool of hate and discord. So every time they open their mouth, all they can speak about is division and discord among our races. We presented a budget. We stood in that parliament and explained every program. Look at our... When we remove VAT on electricity and remove VAT on water and remove VAT on medical supplies and remove VAT from educational items and remove VAT from locally manufactured construction materials, how is that only to benefit Indo-Guyanese? Why are these people so sick? Look at our scholarship program and I want to talk a lot about that tonight. Look at the scholarship program. 20,000 online scholarship. The, I put on my Facebook page the application process. The applications are going to be reviewed not by ministers but by public servants. 75 to 80 percent of the public servants, public servants are non-Indo-Guyanese. That has been so since independence. 90 percent, 80 percent, I don't know what the figure is. They are non-Indo-Guyanese. Every aspect of the public sector, every area of the public service, is dominated by Afro-Guyanese. The evaluators who sit to evaluate contracts at the, at the NPATAB, the National Tender Board, they are, they are drawn from the various ministries. They are Afro-Guyanese. They reflect the ministries. The scholarship programs are going to be reviewed by public servants, a majority of which are Afro-Guyanese. House lot applications. You think ministers sit down and sift through house lot applic applications? It's public servants who have to process those applications. Select them, process them, receive them, and put them into the system. You think ministers do that? And those public servants, the majority of them are Afro-Guyanese. So where is this discrimination that they are speaking about? Of course, I don't want to go and speak about what they did because that is what they did. They discriminated outrightly against everyone else other than their cronies and their friends. I pointed out in the parliament as each minister was going in the select in the committee of supply to defend their budget. I was calling upon the other side of the house, the APNU AFC side of the house, to look at the composition of the staff who accompany those ministers to assist the ministers in the committee of supply. Every time I minister, a minister went there, I drew it to their attention. 
in the National Assembly. Look at the ethnic composition of the permanent secretary as well as the senior officials who sit with ministers. I did not send home a single person from the Ministry of, 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 of Legal Affairs. The same permanent secretary is there, afro Guyanese. The deputy PS was transferred to another ministry because we don't have the need for a deputy PS. The solicitor general is there. Is an afro Guyanese. I didn't move any one of them. Basil Williams, on the other hand, sent away almost every Indo Guyanese who was in the building. But so you, you have every day to confront this baseless, reckless, and damaging narrative that they are creating every single day. But we can't afford to spend time and energy behind that. I believe that is what they want us to do. So that we have to answer them whole day and that detract us from the task of developing the country and moving the lives of our people forward. That is what they want. So the scholarship program, as I explained in my Facebook post yesterday, is perhaps the largest such endeavor, certainly in Guyana, but perhaps in the entire Caribbean. No Caribbean territory has ever undertaken a scholarship program of such magnitude, 20,000 scholarships for Guyanese in almost every discipline. So we have a whole host of scholarships in the area of criminal investigation, scientific forensic investigation, ballistics certificates, fingerprinting, forensic pathology, crime scene investigations, fingerprinting um, certificates and certifications. Why? Because crime is a big issue in this country and we have to improve the crime capability, the crime fighting capability of the state. The criminals are becoming very sophisticated and now, now, nowadays everything is on the internet. People have cell phones. You have to do proper and scientific investigations if you want to yield convictions in the court in a lawful way. And that is what we are doing. Building a human resource capacity base. And that is why I forwarded a whole host of programs relevant to investigating, investigating and, and, and for forensic um, analysis to the police force so that the police force can disseminate it in the police force so that police officers can take advantage of these programs. They can work and they can study. A whole host of them, over a hundred scholarships alone in this area. I don't have, unfortunately, the paper with all the list of the programs with me but I will make it public. And not only should persons from the police force alone apply, but members of the public who are interested in these areas, because you can set up your own private operations. That happens all over the world. You don't have to work with the government if you don't wish to work with the government. Look at the amount of private labs that we have in the country. We have to continue to build that kind of base. We have to, we have to, if we don't have certain skills and skill set within the state apparatus, then we must be able to buy it off the market. It must be available in Guyana. That is the important thing. So this scholarship program is not necessarily to target people in school and persons in working within the government. It is for all Guyanese. And rather than Aubrey Norton publishing nonsensical 
mischief on his Facebook page, he should be advising and encouraging afro Guyanese youth, youths, to take advantage of the government scholarship program. That is what he should be encouraging them to do. And if he sends applications in and they are not being considered, well, then he has a case. It is the same foolishness that they stood in the parliament one after the other during the budget debate and alleged that afro Guyanese did not receive the COVID grant. But each one of them in the parliament, each one of them received theirs. And I said to them, produce the names and telephone numbers of the persons who are excluded. Produce it. Don't produce it to us if you don't want to. Give it to the press. Make it public if you have that kind of information. But don't stand up in the parliament and blatantly lie. And that is what they do. So they go give you a Nancy story about somebody, some person who spoke to them and, and who told them that because they are afro Guyanese, they were skipped in the COVID grant um, distribution of, of, of COVID grant. So assuming that is so, and you are a political leader, you wouldn't take the person's name, you wouldn't take the person's telephone number, you wouldn't post it on your Facebook page, that person would not make his story public. What, what, what kind of foolish propaganda is this? And, and that is part of the problem. They are so inept, they are so incompetent, that they cannot even construct a proper narrative. They say things that are so incredulous and so incredible that no one believes them. No one believes them. Anyhow, I have said enough on that matter. I want to move on to give an update on the legal proceedings because a lot of people out there are anxious and are worried and sometimes are becoming impatient with the rate that these investigations are proceeding and the sloth that they claim which afflict criminal charges. But it is a slow process. The, I want to make it abundantly clear that these are not malicious and vindictive, politically driven investigations. These are investigations that are being properly done without any political direction or interference by the relevant law enforcement agencies taking their time and doing proper work. So when they present a case, they present a proper case. And that accounts for the time that is being taken to get these cases to the court. It is not a swift process by its very nature. So last week, you would have read in the newspaper that Volder Lawrence and Mingo and Carol Joseph appeared before a magistrate's court and they, they were placed on bail. They pleaded not guilty and they were placed on bail. Now, what was holding up this issue? Remember, they are charged with an offense or with offenses that can either be tried in the high court before a judge and a jury or can be tried and concluded in the magistrate's court. Their lawyers obviously would like them to be tried before a judge and a jury. The reason being that one, the case will take a very long time before it gets a date for hearing. 
But more importantly, they will be tried by a jury who will not necessarily follow the law but will act upon instincts that are different not on legal principles and evidence not on the facts but they will be acting on the different influences and in such a case because they are political matters and political people are going to be on the jury you can't stop that and persons will come to conclusions that are tainted with politics and in that case the state will not get a fair trial and that is why the state wants the case or the cases to be done in the magistrate's court one the time is swifter the case will be concluded quicker and you can have a tribunal who understands the law and not a jury you have a magistrate and not a jury who will be hearing and determining these cases. So they were at that stage to determine the mode of going forward. For some time, and this week, the magistrate ruled, after hearing submissions from all sides, the magistrate ruled that Walter Lawrence, Mingo and Sonia Joseph's charges are going to be tried by the magistrate in the magistrate's court so that is why there was some delay you had to get this issue this procedural issue out of the way the other cases as i understand them are in the same and similar circumstances hopefully we get similar rulings from the magistrates and once we cross that hurdle, then the trials shall begin for these charges in the magistrate's court. So keep following in the press. These are important cases. They are important for public order and good governance in this country. They are important for our democracy. And they are important for the general legal system of our country in the sense that persons who may want to do these things in the future must know that the state has a capacity to protect itself and its public system from such conduct and when public officers public officers who are put in charge of the state's machinery misbehave in this way then the state is not going to sit idly by and the rule of law will take over and run its course so that is where the election matters are in the magistrates court then today George Norton, the former Minister of Health, was charged with misconduct in public office in relation to the Sussex Street drugs bond. You will recall that this gentleman, with, I suppose, the support of his cabinet, but cabinet support is not a defense in law. A cabinet can't give you coverage to go and commit a murder or commit a crime. No cabinet has that power. So whether he has a cabinet paper to protect him or not, doesn't matter. Cabinets can't perform, cabinet can't um, violate the law with impunity and then seeks coverage in a cabinet uh, memorandum. That's not the laws of this country. There is no legal defense to any criminal law called cabinet decision. So Aubrey Norton is being charged, not Aubrey Norton, George Norton, sorry, is being charged with misconduct for public office for taking the state's money without any resort to a public procurement process as is mandated by law. 
and take 12 million or 14 million per month and rent a house to store condoms and lubricants. And they did not even use it for that purpose. $14 million per month rental. The man who they rent it from is a crony. We all, we all know the facts. He didn't even own the house. He bought the house for the purpose of this transaction. And this minister is charged. The investigation took a long time. I don't know whether more charges are coming in relation to other persons in respect of the same drug bond. I, am not, I don't get involved in the investigation, but let us wait and see. Then I also want to bring you up to speed with the Court of Appeal decision in the election petition cases because those are important cases as well that the public is very interested in. So, um, one minute. Sorry. So, this week, Monday, I think, we had the Court of Appeal, case management of the appeal that was filed by AP and UAFC against the ruling of Justice George, where Justice George dismissed their petition number 99. Recall that they filed an appeal and we put in a motion, I put in a motion as Attorney General, to say that the court has no jurisdiction to hear and determine that appeal. And also Mr. Uh, Mendez, who is appearing for Bharat Jagdeo, who is the leader of the PPP's list of candidates, also put in some submissions of a similar type. We are contending that the Court of Appeal has no power to hear a case, an appeal like this. I see the uh, Apnu AFC Ramjatan, etc., on the Facebook, um, saying that, well, why are we afraid? Why don't we want the petition to be heard? We are not afraid. You have to comply with the law. You have to, you can't, you have a right to go to court, but when you decide to go to court, you have to comply with the rules and regulations in relation to taking matters to the court. Is that a free for all? You can file anything in the court and just leave it there. The law doesn't operate like that. So if you want to file legal proceedings, do your homework and get it right. And if we, see, if we see that there is a technical way that we can dispose of your case without it wasting the court's time and wasting our time and our energy, we will take that opportunity. That is how lawyers operate. So I am pleased to be the one or to be part of that attempt that is now being made to strike out that appeal and close off that petition once and for all. In relation to the other petition, that is the one dealing with the recount, we heard arguments the court heard arguments from all the lawyers. Well, not all the lawyers. All the lawyers did not participate. Mr. Jeremy appeared for the petitioners. And he spoke. Mr. Astafan appeared for GCOM. And he spoke. Mr. Mendez appeared for Mr. Jagdeo. And he spoke. And I, as Attorney General, appeared in person and I spoke. The other lawyers representing the other parties did not address the court. Neither did they put in written submissions as well. So, we are going to, we have put our oral arguments in, as we were requested to do 
by the Honorable Chief Justice and we completed that. And if I may say so, I am confident that we will succeed in that petition as well. So, if things go the way I see it is going, and I am not prejudging anything, this is just my opinion of how the matter is unfolding, then these two petitions would be out of the way very shortly. And that is how the law is designed to treat with elections petition, not the way that the law was applied in relation to the petition filed by me for the PPP in 2015, up to now that petition cannot be heard. Up to now, can't be heard. But that has been overtaken by time. We are in government and you see how quick the system works. I am not saying that we had anything to do with the system, but I am just showing you when they were in government, for whatever the reason is, whatever the reason, the petition did not come up. That is the fact, up to now. But when we are in government, petitions are moving very quickly. Petitions are moving with, with commendable speed. And we welcome that because that is what we promised. And that is what we intend to deliver to the people. We, we're working with the judiciary every day to ensure that we improve the system. Not interfere with the system, improve the system, modernize the system so that it can deliver decisions with speed. Today also we had submissions in relation to the case filed by Jones, where he wants the court to throw out of the parliament the two parliamentary secretaries, Pandit um, Vikash Ramkisun and Sarah Brown. They want those two out of the parliament. They say they have been wrongly put in the parliament. Well, the case is ongoing. Today we presented our arguments and we will continue to do so. And the court um, has given us some time to pre present some additional arguments tonight. When I finish here, we are going to write some submissions tonight, which we plan to hand over to the court tomorrow. The court has fixed, I think, April the 20th for the ruling in that matter. I suppose whoever wins or loses will appeal. So let us see how that turns out. But I thought that I will bring you up to date on the election type and the political type cases. Of course, there are two more cases in the system which deal with um, their challenge, a, a new AFC challenge or challenges to the budgets. Recall that they challenged the 2020 budget. They said that it's unconstitutional. They challenged the 2021 budget. They're trying to stop the budget, though the budget is passed. Whole set of madness. But that is also in the system. And we are waiting for that um, to, to, to continue as well. Um, I want to use this platform also to extend my deepest sympathies and express my deepest concerns to our brothers and sisters in St. Vincent and the Grenadines who are under threat. I mean, this is a natural disaster of horrific proportions and thousands of people, thousands of people are at the mercy of this um, natural disaster and we hope and we pray that everything will be all right and as you see and you would have observed in the public domain our government is fully on board with a, um, an aid program I think a boat has already left with supplies and we will continue to monitor 
the situation and we continue to pledge our continued support to our brothers and sisters in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Now the COVID situation is getting worse. And while we are increasing the vaccines and the rate at which vaccines are being disseminated, the rates are climbing. I think today we passed about, I think today we surpassed 130, I'm not sure. So about somewhere thereabouts of deaths. And this is indeed catastrophic. So I continue to appeal to every Guyanese to please observe the protocols, please observe the COVID-19 measures. I believe that we are appealing to our Hindu brothers and sisters during this Naurat, do not go to the Mandirs. Do not go to the Mandirs. You can still do your prayers at home. Please do not congregate. Every time you congregate, you expose yourselves and you expose others to this deadly virus. We are making a similar appeal to our Muslim brothers and sisters. Do not assemble in the mosques in the night. I know that it is a great tradition. I enjoy it. I participate in it. The food is great and the atmosphere is, is electric, <coughs> but it is simply not safe this time around. So please desist from gathering in the mosques and in the mandirs during this auspicious period and during this holy month of Ramadan. And also, please ensure that you are vaccinated. We have, now, we have received another 30,000 doses of the Sputnik vaccine and we are encouraging you. We are encouraging you again and again to get yourself vaccinated. Vaccine centers are opened across the country. We are using residences. We are using NDCs. We are using um, community centers. We are using mosques masjids, uh, temples, churches, all public places that are convenient and accessible to the public. We are using them to roll out this very aggressive vaccination campaign and exercise. And we appeal to every one of you to get your vaccines in time and get it early. We have, we continue to buy, your government is spending a lot of money in getting vaccines available. This vaccine is not easy to get. You may have the money, but it's simply not available on the world market. India, for example, is buying out most, if not all, the vaccines that are being produced in India. And India is the largest producer because they have a serious outbreak in India recently. So they are using up all the vaccines or most of it for their own consumption. And that obviously has had a devastating, devastating impact on the global availability of vaccines. But we are working night and day. Your government is working night and day the President, the Minister of our, um, Health, the Dr. Ram Sami and their team, we are all working night and day to ensure that we have enough vaccines in the country. So please do not let us waste this opportunity. People right around in the Caribbean can't get vaccines and do not have access to vaccines in the way that we do in Guyana. We are perhaps heading or leading in the vaccination drive. But that's not something to boast about. It's just an exemplification of our efficiency and competent government at work. Um, the 
I want to go back to the scholarship program because I got the document that I was referring to. And let me to build only in our forensic capabilities to fight crime in a scientific fashion. These are the courses that are included in the government's uh, scholarship program. Forensic science and criminal investigation, fingerprint examination and analysis, document and handwriting examination, crime scene investigation, forensic graphology, ethical hacking and IT security, cyber forensic investigation, cyber law and digital forensic, forensic engineering, private investigation and detective, forensic medicine and toxicology, forensic accounting, insurance fraud investigation, forensic photography, forensic biometric analysis, DNA fingerprinting, forensic drugs analysis, forensic biology, ballistic and firearms study, criminology and victimology, forensic odontology, forensic etymology, wildlife forensic, forensic psychology. All of these are cases, all of these are courses that are available under the government scholarship program. And we are crime scene investigation and management, fingerprint examination. All these are areas that are available on the online scholarship program. The idea is to have enough resource base here so that we can begin to set up the training centers here as well so that we don't have to depend on a constant importation of these skill sets. Remember, we have to prepare Guyana and that is our drive, that is our plan. Preparing Guyana for what is to come. Guyana, as I keep saying, and as we keep saying as a government, is the destination to be in the Western Hemisphere over the next 5, 10, 15 years. This is the place. And we have to therefore build the infrastructure. We have to build the human resource base. We have to build the, the, the environment. We have to build the whole country. And this, these are ways that we are planning to do so, to engage, to train and educate our people and spend a lot of time and a lot of money on these, on these programs because we want our people to be educated. That is the importance of these scholarship programs and don't sit at home and wait i have put the information online we have put it on facebook it is available at the ministry please go and don't wait until the application uh, the time is gone for the application and then you hold your head and then you start to you know you you try to then get on to the program. We are encouraging you to get on early. Go get your applications done so that we can continue to push this program forward. And as I said, there are most of the courses, most of the program will be fully funded by the government of Guyana. And importantly, the universities that are offering this and these trainings are universities of international reputation. They are universities that have intellectual standing and integrity. So when you get your certification and your degrees or whatever it is, the diploma or the certificate, it will be 
from a university that commands the respect of not only Guyanese companies and the Guyanese state, but right across the Caribbean. So please ensure that you take advantage of the government's scholarship program. We are also in the process and a parliament has not been meeting for a while now, but we are in the meanwhile, the government's uh, legislative agenda continues. And every day at the Attorney General Chambers, we are working and consulting on new pieces of legislation. The process is an ongoing one. We have several pieces of legislation that are currently in the pipeline and some of them are completed and are waiting to be tabled in the next sitting of the National Assembly which hopefully should take place shortly. So the government's um, legislative agenda is continuing at a pace and every ministry has three, four pieces of legislation that they are working on now. Our approach to legislation is a consultative one. So we consult publicly, we consult privately, and then even then, when it reaches the National Assembly, we also consult by sending it to special select committee if we think that there is that desire. We have a few bills in the select committee at the National Assembly already. We have the Narcotics Amendment Bill, which is the bill to, that will remove custodial sentence sentences from small amounts of marijuana and also we have um, the higher purchase bill it's a big bill a substantive piece of legislation that we have also remitted to the select committee and um, hopefully that select committee will begin to sit shortly and start to work on that those two um, pieces of legislation. Um, the Constitutional Reform Committee, we have to get that committee also going because work has to begin in that committee. We had two meetings and we are still in the process of working out the programmatic agenda of that committee. I am the chairman and very shortly before the end of this week or I think next week we will have to convene a meeting of the committee. Um, there is one last issue that I would like to speak on and it is the issue of hemp. Hemp. Recall when we, when we took office or rather during the elections campaign we met with a number of organizations that were pushing and are pushing hemp production in our country. We promised during the campaign that we will take the matter seriously and we will look at the matter. I was tasked by Cabinet and His, and His Excellency, the President, with the responsibility of examining hemp and hemp production to see whether it is legal or whether it is a narcotic that is prohibited under the Narcotics and Psychotrophic Substance Act. 
I did my analysis and from all indications, from all the readings, from all the um, analysis that I have examined, the conclusion is that it is not a narcotics and it is not prohibited by our law. But it should be regulated because it can easily move from hemp production to something else. That is why I recommended that we go with legislation. So the Ministry of Agriculture now is charged with moving that process forward. How they wish that program dealing with hemp to unfold would be a matter for the Ministry of Agriculture and of course cabinet will have an input but that is where the hemp issue is now a lot of people have met me recently and have inquired and are inquiring about where it is and that is where it is now it is with the minister of agriculture to determine the way forward with hemp i have given the legal clearance so it is there and hopefully we will hear soon from the Minister, Minister of Agriculture. My operator is signaling to me that we are approaching program time. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for spending the last 50 or so minutes with me. I think that we had a good discussion. I believe that I would have disseminated a large amount of information which is relevant and which of course I hope that you observe and make good use of. This is where I have to say goodbye and thank you very much for joining me over the past 50 minutes or so in another program of issues in the news. I will see you next week Tuesday. Please take care, enjoy the rest of the week, stay safe and please let us observe the COVID protocols regulation. It is literally a matter of life and death. Thank you and good evening once again.